This is all our conflict. It's pretty devastating. Head in, head in, head in. I think we're all very, very shaken. Who knows what she'd witnessed in the past month? Morawi is in the Philippines on the southern island of Mindanao, it's a provincial capital. Now Philippines as a nation is largely Christian, but um, Mindanao itself, the island, has, uh, has the biggest concentration of Muslims in the Philippines. It's a small city, it sits on a lake, very, very poor area, lots and lots of uh, guns uh, among the population, a long history of separatist conflict. This was what looked like it might be a new front in that fight against Islamic State. We saw Islamic State appealing to their followers that if you can't get to Iraq or Syria, go to the Philippines. And this was where, in May 2017, hundreds of militants had taken control. <laughs> What they'd done, they'd taken the city by storm. It happened very suddenly. It certainly caught Philippines government forces by surprise. Because there wasn't very much reporting coming out of it, it was really difficult to get a sense of it from afar. We knew going into this that there was going to be nowhere that we could definitely say was safe. It was difficult to know exactly where the different positions were because the government forces didn't want media embedding with them. So you were very much just on your own in the city. But as soon as we got there, it was apparent that this was really full-scale urban conflict. I remember us crouching down on a roof and just kind of looking at each other because it was constant gunfire solid firefights going on left, right and centre across the city and we were thinking, oh, wow, this is full on, <laughs> you know. The first day is always the worst because you have no idea what you're going to get, so you're, you're literally filming everything that moves. You exposed their curve to take a step back. You just never know when you're going to record something that is valuable and you're never going to get that chance to get it again. We're pretty close to the front line here. The fighting is intense and it is sustained. It has been going on like this now for several hours. It's quite difficult to film a moving aircraft against a bright, lit sky. It's quite difficult to get in focus, to get the exposure right. They were using fighter jets, they were using helicopters. Try to get those on a few occasions, you get them dropping bombs and it's, you know, people in the buildings were, you know, getting smashed. I realised fairly quickly that they were doing so much bombing, I had plenty of opportunities to get the shots. It was just constant. That's the irony of it. You're worried that it's not going to be the story that you thought you'd pitch to London. <laughs> and then we got there and we thought, wow, actually, this is, this is much, much bigger than we were expecting. This is a strong story that needs to be told here. We had a brand new drone, which I hadn't used before. This was its first outing. I was quite cautious to begin with, staying at a relatively safe distance. I remember my producer asking me if we could get a little bit closer, so I took a brave pill and went in and got properly low. I remember sweeping shot across the mosque, and it, yeah, it looked amazing. There were fires everywhere, and there was ash floating through the air. There were also white specks that were moving so quickly, you know, fractions of a second, so I assumed it was white, hot bits of lead basically flying through the screen. Some of them were towards the drone. IS been known to use drones in Iraq and Syria, so the military are shooting them down. 
The military were using their own drones as well, and so IS was shooting them down. It was constantly people were trying to stop us filming. What we did see, it was pretty devastating. We'd got a lot of footage of very heavy fighting, uh, but what we really wanted to do was speak to some people. We'd heard about the horrors of people being used as human shields, sex slaves. We kind of wanted to hear that directly for ourselves rather than secondhand. What order are you guys going to go in? First, we film you. Yeah. We thought that we were going to an area that was relatively safe. So I'm running to the far side of the street or diagonal? Go, go, go straight down here. Yeah. And when you get to the blue car, just directly. Okay. So, guys, do you want to tell them that's yeah, so straight down to the blue car? Straight down to the blue vehicle. Because of not being entirely sure whose sights we might be in at any one time, when we went to cross the road, we would go one after the other in single file. Right, let's go. Yeah. We knocked on the door and it wasn't opening. <laughs> and so as we were waiting, suddenly in came a huge round it, it, and, it, and it, it sounded so close. <laughs> We just kicked the door in, burst in within a few seconds, and we were then inside. Uh, targeted. It didn't seem random. It didn't seem by accident. Who is shooting? That wasn't a stray bullet. I felt targeted. We are targeting uh, you. So who's targeting us? Yes, every day. Team the sniper. Felt safe, but then soon turned out there was a fire of some sort very nearby which was filling the building with smoke. There, somewhere. Is everyone OK? At that point, our only option was to get back out, and get to our vehicle and get away. OK, All right, yeah. All right. So, we're going to go? He's right here. OK. I was positioned to go first, so it was quite a moment. Come, go, go, go. Running out of the door and into the street, not knowing what was going to happen, thinking maybe there's going to be another shot. Okay, okay you're going to go first because you need to get into the back. Okay, of the right, go. go. We had to run around the vehicle, jump in, wait for the whole team to get in, get that sliding door across, and then get out of there. Get down, Kev. Okay. Head down, head down, head down. Yeah. That was terrifying, really. Running back out that door into an area that's potentially someone looking down the scope of a rifle watching you do that. That was frightening. It was just a desire to get into that, that vehicle as quickly as possible and get out of there. I think we were all very, very shaken, but thankfully we managed to get everyone out safely. We then heard they were going to have a few hours ceasefire. We were out in the street waiting for teams of civilian rescuers who were going to try and go into the militant control side to try and bring some of the hostages out because it was apparent that there were still hundreds and hundreds of people trapped over there. After a number of hours of waiting, two army vehicles came out from the militant controlled area. I remember the jeep stopping and just seeing in the back of it a female soldier holding a very small baby who looked extremely confused. There was this little face, this little girl's face, and she just looked bemused. Who knows what she'd witnessed in the past month. Behind her, two very young women, maybe in their late teens, who just looked just so confused, so dazed, who had been living through, by that point, a month of airstrikes in the militant-controlled area, actually sheltering in a basement. I think the image of the people coming out of the army vehicle and trying to process what had happened is really 
quite stark and there were hundreds and hundreds of people in that situation. Liberation basically looked like devastation. The difference between the aerial shots from before, where it was green and you could see trees, and after five months of fighting, it's just all grey. There's cement and dust everywhere. It was just such a different place. Daily airstrikes had levelled huge parts of the city. This was not lost on the government forces side of it was an issue of people's perception that regardless of who had started this, the government forces had done this. The most difficult thing about getting into the city once it had been liberated was getting the permission from the military to go in. It was still very dangerous there. There was IEDs potentially rigged on houses, there was walls that could come down. So we were in the military's hands in terms of getting in. They had to trust us, we had to trust them, and they were also keen not for us to show too much of the damage, because a lot of that damage was due to military bombing. They were very concerned that this might shift quite quickly from anger with the militants to anger with the government. Once we were in, though, it was something else, really. We'd seen the city from afar when we first went, and now we were right in the middle of what we'd been filming from above on the drone and through a long lens camera. It's quite surreal to suddenly be there and just to see what litter was left. There was graffiti all over the walls claiming the Islamic State Caliphate. There was people's possessions sprawled out across the floor. There was just utter devastation, really. Just talking to the survivors and the people that have been pulled out, these people have not only lived through that, but their houses, their livelihoods, everything's been destroyed, pretty much. And it's just, it's quite, Emotional, talking to these people. The house is uh, totally destroyed. It's just horrendous, you know, listening to the stories of what they went through. Look, look, this is only the lift. Look what happened here. Please, world, help us. We are innocent. No. What really jumped out was as they came out, their shock at how much had been looted from their own homes. They took everything, even iron, even... Uh, Rice cooker, small one. There was this kind of bubbling anger from these people of who did this. And it was very clear that they blamed the military. Who do you think took it? This place is controlled by a military. As we left, it felt very much that there's this huge job in Marawi of not only rebuilding the city, which basically has to start from the ground up, they have to completely replan that town. But also, they have to win back the trust of people who live there in what is a very kind of fertile area already for extremists. The real test of Marawi was whether the Islamic State could operate somewhere outside of the Middle East. Is this the start of what they wanted to call a caliphate in the region? They were pushed out, but it took five months to do it. And during that time, it was powerful propaganda. This shows the chance to go and fight a war with a national army, which is an ally of the United States, and hold them off. So there is a real danger that this happens again. This was not a one-off. 